The text for our sermon this eighth Sunday after Trinity is recorded in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. We read, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. There is, is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Here ends our reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. The theme for the sermon today is the following. The Lord, the living God, enlivens. In this Old Testament reading, God is revealing himself to the people of Israel as being the only God, their king, and their redeemer. He is the creator, the source of their life. He is the Lord, and thus, he is not limited by time. He announces what will happen in the future, and nothing is hidden from him. He is the first, and he is the last, and everything exists in and through him. The Lord, the living God, enlivens. He who created the world made for himself his own people. He gave that people a life through the womb of Sarah that was dead and lifeless by bringing into the world the son of promise, her son Isaac. And the prophet Isaiah announces that the Lord had made for himself, he had fashioned a people in the womb of her mother and that he had sustained her. God is faithful and he doesn't abandon his people. Even if the people to whom Isaiah was preaching was unfaithful, and they were, God promises that he would send his spirit on the descendants of this people so that they would grow and put their trust in him. In speaking of the generation that was to come, he prophesies in verse 3, one will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will want to bear the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will take with with great joy and, and pride the name of Israel. The people to whom Isaiah was speaking were unfaithful, and that's why, just after our lecture, God makes fun of them. He compares their lifeless idols that were useless, that these people adored. These sacred sculptures that couldn't see anything, that couldn't know anything, that couldn't do anything, and yet people were putting their confidence in them. You see, these false gods only existed by the hands of men. You get uh, the metal worker who's working with, with his tools and he fashions with his hammer, He gives his all to make a god, and he finishes by being hungry and having weakened himself. Or you get the carpenter who uh, works on the wood and shapes it so that it looks like a man. And he uses the part of the wood, the, the scraps that he produced, to build a fire, to warm himself, to cook his next meal. And then he bows down before the other half that he sculpted and worships it, And he prays to it and says, save me, because you, you are my God. And it's ridiculous, because before our text, God says, 
I have made you as my people. And what happens after? The people say, Ah, I have made for myself a God. And sadly, we become like our gods. Either we become like the living God who enlivens us and makes us, or we become like the gods that we make, dead and lifeless, unable to be saved. Those who worship these idols, these lifeless pieces of things that have been created, they, they aren't saved. And so God in our text is warning the people against idolatry, warning that they're going to die, that he's going to allow the Babylonians to conquer them, and that the royal lineage of David, they would no longer sit on the throne in Jerusalem. But God promises that he will remain faithful to his people and that he will bring them back into the promised land. He was going to reestablish the, priestly, the, the kingly line through the Messiah. And so it is that he could say to his people, don't tremble, don't be afraid, because the Lord was going to take this people and raise them up again. He was going to Give them new life. God calls his people to trust in him because the Lord, the living God, enlivens. God is faithful, and he redeems his people Israel from slavery in Egypt. And he was going to redeem his people from their captivity in Babylon. But you see, God had in mind an even greater redemption. And it's not a redemption only of the Jews, but it is a redemption of the world over. Through Jesus, through this promised Messiah, God redeemed the universe from sin and from all evil. Jesus has redeemed you. He has paid for you through his word. He brings that to you. That's why Jesus has become a man. The Lord, the living God, enlivens. He enlivens you. Through the womb of Mary, it was one thing for um, Sarah's dead womb to be able to bring forth the child of promise, Isaac. It's an even greater miracle that we confess in the Creed, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. She, who had not known a man, bore the Son of God who united himself to his creation. And he did this to redeem that creation. And he paid the ultimate price. The living God gave his life. He was crucified. He died for the sins of the world. This lifeless body of Jesus that was hanging on a cross, he who is God in human flesh, was buried. But the living God enlivens, and Jesus rose from the dead the third day. Death no longer has power over him. He is the master of the universe. He is the one who holds the keys of death and hell. He is the first and the last. And besides him, there is no other God. This resurrection of Jesus Christ is the historical event that distinguishes the Christian faith from every other religion in this world. It is the good news of forgiveness and life that gives hope, that hope of eternal life for you and for me. But this work of new life, of redemption, isn't just an historical act separated from us by thousands of years. Jesus continues to bring that redemption to people today. That's why we rejoice that God has brought the child of Frederick and Gutburg, who is called by her name Anna Christburg. He gave this child new life through holy baptism. Jesus paid for the price 
to redeem her through his death 2,000 years ago. But as I said, God is not limited by time, and he intervenes in time here and now. He takes what he accomplished 2,000 years ago, and he unites it to his promise of forgiveness and salvation, attaching that to water. Now, without that word of God, it's ordinary water. But baptism is a water that is united to the commandment and to the promise of God's word. And baptism gives the forgiveness of sins. It delivers from death and the devil. It offers eternal salvation to all of those who believe, according to the words and to the promises of God. The Lord, the living God, enlivens. And so it was that Anna Christborg is alive from today and forevermore with a new life. As St. Paul writes to the Colossians, you who were buried with Jesus through baptism, you have been raised with him and through him by faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. You who were dead because of your sinful acts and the uncircumcision of your bodies. He has made you alive with him, with Jesus. He has forgiven you all of your wrongs. He has wiped clean the act that was written against us, that condemned us by its prescriptions. And he has canceled it by nailing it to the cross. God renews us through his word. He sustains us in our faith. God, who gave life to Anna Christborg through her parents, gave her a new life and made her his own child. And in the same way that the people of God in the Old Testament didn't do anything so that God would make for him a people for his own pleasure, Anna didn't do anything so that Jesus would give her a new life and make her a new creature in Christ. In this prophecy from Isaiah 44, verse 5 says that the believers will take the name of the Lord. One will say, I belong to the Lord. The other will bear the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, property of the Lord, and will take with pride the name of Israel. And so it is that Anna Christborg has taken the name of Christ, having received that name of Christ on her forehead and on her heart to mark her as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. But let's look even further into how she bears the name of Christ as we think about what her name actually means. Her father told me, and I double-checked with him just to make sure I didn't get this wrong, but Anna means grace or favor. And then the name Christborg means Christ is my refuge or my fortress. And so it is, this name that her parents gave her, that was made public during the baptismal service, means the grace of Christ is my fortress. That name, Anna Christborg, is a confession of salvation that Jesus offers. And this promise is for you also. What Jesus gave to Anna Christborg, he offers it to all by the baptism that she received. This is a free gift of God, just like salvation is the free, gracious gift of God. And it's not that we make ourselves so that we might become the people of God. No, this is his work. He created us. He makes us a new creation. He forgives us. He enlivens us. Because it is the Lord, the living God, who enlivens. In the name of Jesus, our living Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, 
keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith in Jesus Christ unto life everlasting. Amen.